In this short presentation, we are going to be going over some more details, a little more specific information about your upcoming art analysis. Um, the prompt for this is also posted in this week's folder, so you can read the guidelines there and also the images are there for you. But I wanted to give a little more detailed information in this short lecture. This again for many of you is the first time that you're going to be writing for me. That's why this essay is a little shorter and usually worth a little less points. So what you're going to do in this, in MLA format, um, which includes typed, I want your paper stapled because if this is a, also an in-class class or a hybrid, you will be turning in a paper copy of it. That's the one I'm going to grade. Um, you'll need a work cited, you'll need in-text citations and all of that. If you are unfamiliar with MLA format, refer to the two references I've already mentioned, the AL at Purdue website and the MLA handbook for writers, 8th um, edition. This paper is going to be a short one, about 600 to 800 words, about two to three pages, which in MLA that is double spaced. Um, I will let you know I am not going to be somebody who stops reading at word 801 or at the end of page three. However, please don't give me five or six page papers. That's not something you need to do in this essay. But if you go over the word count and the page limit a little bit, that's fine. However, I will tell you, if you don't reach the minimum, the 600 words, the two pages, I promise you, you've probably not said enough in this essay. But what you're going to do here is I've given you four different artworks to choose from. They're all four paintings because we've only looked at two-dimensional art so far. And they are all very well known. So what you're going to do is you're going to choose one of these. Then you're going to give a formal analysis using at least two of the different elements and principles of composition as discussed in class, in the online lecture, and in your textbook. Now with this, as you know, or you should know from already having reviewed that lecture, there are many elements and principles of composition, line, color, texture, chiaroscuro, harmony. Um, this is not, I don't want you to look at one of the paintings and try to talk about 10 different elements and principles, because if you do that, you're probably not going to do any of it well. For this, I would pick two and focus on those. And remember, it's not just saying where they are in the work. It's answering the so what question. So if you're looking one of the painting you choose, say you choose the Judas slaying Halifernes, and you decide one of the elements you're going to talk about is color. Well, it's not just enough to say that there's color in the work. You need to answer the so what question. You need to answer, well, how and why is the color important to the work? What does it do? And that's what I would focus on. One paragraph for each of the elements and then move on. Next, what you're going to do is you're going to do a little research and then you're going to give a contextual analysis of the work. Now, this is not a history or a biography. I don't want you to tell me all about the author. I don't want you to give me a, a report on the painting. Contextual analysis, remember, it's going to be find that one interesting outside fact and then again do the analysis, how and why it affects the work. Think about when we were looking at this in class, when we had the one abstract painting and we looked at it formally, we talked about line, color, and all that. And then when we moved to contextual, we found out it was painted by an elephant. Well, that can be very important. That can change how it's viewed because contextually that's important to the work because maybe it completely ch changes our perception of it where we had higher standards when we thought it was painted by a human that now we might have different standards when we realize it's painted by an elephant. And that's what you're going to do in this, okay? Just find that one piece of contextual information, tell the reader what it is and how and why it influences the work. Remember, you still need that so what factor. Um, and then what I do is I gave you on the prompt, I give you a, a, a format for this that I would recommend. This paper should be at least five paragraphs, and I have suggested format for you in the prompt itself. This is what it is. Basically, it should be about five paragraphs. First, paragraph one, a short introduction where we introduce the painting, um, give all of its important information. Second paragraph should be your first element or principle of composition. Say what it is, where it is in the work, why it's important. Third paragraph, second element and principle of composition. 
fourth paragraph, your contextual analysis, and then your fifth paragraph, a conclusion. Your first paragraph and your fifth paragraph are probably going to look a lot the same. Now remember, this is not a personal response paper, so it should be written in the academic third person, meaning you should not be saying, well, I think color is important, or I see, or I believe. That is a personal response. You need to learn how to make a claim in an essay and support it using your evidence using the third person. Pronouns in third person, he, she, it. First person is the I, we, you, us. Like we know the person writing, the narrator is the writer. Second person, the only pronoun is you. That's where the writer is directly talking to the viewer. You see this, you see that. Neither first nor second person is acceptable for academic writing. You need to be writing in the academic third person. Now that doesn't mean I always get people to say, well then how if I can't use my opinion, how can I write that? Look at it this way. If you think color is important in Judas slang Halifernes, don't say, well, I think color is important because blah, blah, blah. Just simply state, color is important because blah, blah, blah. You don't need that I think in there. Think of it this way. If I said, I think the sky is blue compared to the sky is blue, which one are you going to believe more? Probably the second one. If we say things such as, I think the sky is blue, the reader could go, number one, what do I care what you think? Number two, it sounds unsure. Well, if you only think it's blue, you don't know, why should I, as the reader, believe you? So that academic third person is going to sound much more, um, should sound much more convincing to your reader. Now, along with that, this is also not a research paper where I want to see that you can research what other people have said about this. Do not research somebody else's formal or contextual analysis of these paintings. I don't want you to go and tell me what John Smith said about one of the works. I want to hear your claims and your support. If you just copy the analysis from somebody else, you're going to fail the paper. That's not what I'm looking for. Also in this, remember it's MLA format, so you must have in-text citations and a works cited page. And you will have at least two things in your works cited page. The first, the painting itself. Now I want you to think of, as you're looking at the paintings, imagine as if you're standing right in front of them. So to find out how to cite a painting, go to Alec Purdue and type MLA painting in a, in a works cited, and it'll show you how to do that. So that's the first thing, the painting. The second thing you must have is where you get your contextual information from, and there should be a full citation there. Now, if you use another source, say you um, define what line is according to your textbook, then you will also need to have that in your work cited, but it's not a requirement. So minimum those two things. Um, I will happily answer any questions about the paper through email. However, <coughs> excuse me, I do not read full drafts over email. The reason for that is because about 10 o'clock the night before it's due, I get 22 emails asking me to read them. That's not going to happen. Um, but I will happily go over a draft with you in person. So if you would like to meet with me um, about anything with the paper, it doesn't even have to be a full draft. If you've got a question, um, not sure even how to start, you can email me. We can set up a time and a place to have a meeting. And if it's just a simple question, such as like, you know, hey, I'm going to do this painting, and I'm thinking about this element and this element, you know, what do you think of this? That's absolutely fine. Shoot me an email on that. Um, please do not send me emails, though, saying, here's my citation. Is it correct? Because the only thing I can say is yes or no. You've got the resources. You need to be checking if those are correct or not. All right, if this class is an in-person class or a hybrid class, you will need to turn in a hard copy on the due date. The due date is stated in the prompt, and it's also stated in the syllabus. This needs to be printed out, needs to be stapled, if that is a pet peeve of mine, and turned in when called for. Please do not wait to the last minute to print out your paper. This might sound mean, but... You know, your printer gets jammed, you run out of ink, you run out of paper, oh, you were going to print at school, but they're having an issue. Um, that's your problem, not mine. The paper is due when it is due. Now, if it's a, just an online class, obviously you will only be submitting it online. 
in class and hybrid classes, you must also submit your paper online and Blackboard. And you'll see it's already posted in the week's folder for whatever week it is due. If you are having issues with this, you'll see I say those aren't due till 11.59 p.m. If you can't get your essay to post to Blackboard um, before class, save it on a thumb drive, bring it to class, and I'll help you, um, I'll help you upload it. As always, any form of plagiarism will result in a zero, meaning if you don't have in-text citations and or a works cited page, your paper is already plagiarized and you've already failed. So make sure you are following those guidelines. All right, um, some of the paintings you get to choose from, the first is Judith Slang Holofernes, and you'll see on the prompt, um, I've given you full bibliographical information. Now those are not in correct MLA format, so you'll have to do that, but I've given you all the information. First is Judith Slang Holofernes by Artemisia Gentileschi, 1620. It is an oil on canvas, and this is in the Uffizi uh, Gallery in Florence, Italy. Now, please pay close attention to this year. This is 1620. She did actually two versions of this painting four years apart. If you are looking at one and Judith and her maidservant are wearing blue and gold dresses, you're looking at the wrong painting. But this one is from the Baroque era. The next, we have Les Demoiselles de Avignon by Pablo Picasso, 1907 also an oil on canvas, and this is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Third, we have Jacob Lawrence's number 49. So the painting itself is titled number 49, but it's from a series of paintings he did which are titled The Migration of the Negro, 1940 to 41, and this one is Tempera on Masonite, and this is in the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. And then the last work is the Tower of Babel. Again, this is one you need to be careful of. There are different versions of the Tower of Babel by many different painters. You are looking at Peter Bruegel the Elders from 1563. He actually even also has two different paintings. So make sure you are looking at the correct one. Peter Bruegel the Elders, circa 1563. This is an oil on wood panel. So this is a Renaissance work. Um, the Jacob Lawrence work is a more contemporary, modern work. Les Demoiselles de, de, de Avignon by Picasso is a Cubist work, so it's also modernist. And I've already said Judas Lang Holofernes is a Baroque piece. Now, part of the reason why I chose these four paintings, they are very, very popular, very well known. When you go to do your research, honestly, you're probably going to have to do about 10 minutes of research. You're going to put it in Google, and you're going to get a bunch of hits. Now remember, probably the first hit you're going to get is going to be Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not a credible academic source. The reason why this is so, because anybody can go in and edit a wiki. So you really can't guarantee the information is correct. Now I will say a couple things about Wikipedia. Wikipedia usually has very good um, artwork images. In fact, I think most of mine I took from Wikipedia. So to go look at the art, that's a good place. And a well-written Wikipedia article will often have citations down at the bottom. Go look at those citations. Then if they're credible sources, that could possibly be a source you could use. But again, I'm not expecting you to have to do hours of research. Honestly, you'll probably find your contextual fact in about 10 minutes. But just make sure you're getting it from a credible academic source and that you're correctly citing it. All right, I think that covers it. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me directly.